Hello, my name is James Grebel, and today we're here in Visible Vaults, and we're going to talk about this Roman-era mosaic from the city of Antioch in what was then Syria, but today is Turkey. This mosaic was excavated between 1932 and 1939, and if you look carefully at the mosaic, you can see that it is fragmentary. Part of it was probably destroyed when the buildings were damaged in a severe earthquake, and there was also remodeling that was done to the house that this uh, was located in. The picture is um, what's generally called a genre scene, which means a scene of everyday life. We don't see the two figures in it having any kind of attributes from mythology. They're not gods. They're not great heroes from the classical uh, legends and myths. It just seems to be a man departing in a wheeled vehicle with a horse, uh, drawing the vehicle, and probably to um, the right-hand side of the mosaic is a woman standing there with sort of a sack over her shoulder. We don't really know anything about their status or who they are. Um, and so it's uh, generally called a departure scene. This kind of scene is fairly common in ancient mosaics of the Roman era including the provincial mosaics like this one. Uh, sometimes, in fact, they did have a mythological context, and this might have been a chariot, and it's uh, a hero with a helmet and uh, armor and sword and so on going off to battle. But in this case, it seems much more mundane. It's maybe a man going off on a journey, leaving his wife behind, or some such scene. This kind of mosaic um, was very prolific throughout the Roman world. You find examples like it in North Africa, in all of the territories that were conquered by the Romans. Um, this particular one dates probably to the latter half of the third century CE, which means common era, uh, and it was uh, located in a suburb of the town of Antioch on the Orontes. The suburb is called Daphne, and as I mentioned, it was excavated uh, along with um, parts of the main uh, area of Antioch by a consortium of universities and museums, uh, including the Worcester Museum, the Princeton Museum, the Dumbarton Oaks, uh, Baltimore Museum of Art, and several other institutions between 1932 and 39. And during the, that series of excavations, they found over 300 mosaics. And there was a very liberal policy in the Syrian government at the time, allowing these institutions to export the archeological finds that they dug up, including these uh, some 300 mosaics. And so they were brought back to the United States by the various institutions that excavated them. And it turns out that some of them had more than they had room to house. And so for instance, Princeton Museum, then decided to sell some of their excess mosaics in the early 40s. So our museum was fortunate enough to purchase this particular mosaic in 1945 from Princeton University. This uh, came from a house that was named by the excavators the House of Menander. Now Menander was a Latin poet, and the reason they named the house the House of Menander was because they found in the house, in a different room from this one, a mosaic of the poet Menander reclining on a couch next to his uh, mistress, named a woman named Glycera, and uh, several other figures were in it. And so that name then became applied to the whole house because they don't know really who owned the home. It was occupied for several hundred years. It was remodeled and changed from time to time. But this was probably created between maybe 270 and 300 uh, CE. Now, the town of Antioch itself, in fact, was a very important part of the Roman Empire. It was founded, in fact, before the Romans were in important power uh, by the general who worked for um, Alexander the Great, the Macedonian uh, young general and leader who conquered much of the known world at that time. And this general's name was Seleucus I. And so after Alexander's death, his general sort of divided up his empire into different kingdoms. Uh, one took over Egypt and based in Alexandria, and Seleucus ended up with the area that was known as Syria that included what is modern day Syria, Lebanon, but also part of Turkey. And the city that he founded as his capital, he named for his father Antiochus. 
And so that's where the city got its name Antioch. Now, Antioch on the Orontes simply means it's the city of Antioch on the river Orontes. And in fact, it's about 15 miles inland from the Mediterranean. So this was a navigable river, and that made this a very prosperous town because trade went up and down the river to the city uh, in ships and then was distributed all over uh, the Roman world. The city of Antioch was in fact about the third largest city in the Roman Empire um, after Rome itself and then after Alexandria, Egypt. And so Antioch, probably at its height, grew to have between 500,000 and 800,000 inhabitants, which was a very large city for the second, third centuries um, of the Common Era. Uh, as I mentioned, this particular mosaic came from a, a, a house that was located in a suburb, if you will, a rather a sort of elite area about five miles outside of Antioch proper. It was called Daphne, that area was. And there were dozens of villas of the very wealthy in that area. And this, in fact, came from the most extensive villa um, in the area as I said earlier, mention uh, the name of the, the House of Menander. Uh, it had something like 20, 25 rooms at one time, which is a pretty large house uh, for that era. Uh, some of the very large formal reception rooms, like a dining room and a, a parlor, which would have been called a tablinum in Latin, uh, or even the atrium, which was sort of the entry hall, had much more elaborate and formal mosaics, uh, often depicting the Greek or Roman gods, and um, they were of a probably, I think we'd call it a more Hellenistic style. This one I would call more of a vernacular style, in other words, more of a popular style. If you look, for instance, at the wheeled vehicle and the horse, they're at a kind of an odd angle, so the artist hasn't quite mastered the classical idea of perspective. It doesn't quite line up uh, geometrically. Uh, and the scale of the buildings is um, a little bit out of whack with the size of the figures in it. But these kinds of um, polychrome tile floors uh, were used throughout these Roman houses, basically in a kind of a hierarchy. So as I say, the most uh, uh, formal and uh, public rooms would have the highest quality and most elaborate mosaics. And then maybe the living quarters of the family would have slightly less. and then the servant quarters and the utility areas would have either just plain uh, uh, tile mosaic floors or no floor at all, maybe just a sort of a, a packed earth or a cement. The way these are made, in fact, is interesting uh, because they are made, in fact, of little cubes of stone, uh, either limestone or marble, uh, and the color is natural to the stone. So in other words, they're not painted or dyed in any way. And so that was a sort of a special skill that they had a number of people in their workshops. These mosaicists would not work alone. They would have a whole workshop of people. And they would uh, sort the stones by color. They would cut them into roughly cubic size. Um, you can see they're all kind of arranged in a grid-like pattern. Um, and if they ever ran into a problem finding a natural stone in the color they wanted, they often would resort to using glass because glass could be made in many different colors. This particular mosaic doesn't have glass because it's all pretty much earth tones, the natural tones. But when they get into things like blues and greens, the things that don't occur in, naturally in stone, some of the more elaborate mosaics, they might have to go and use some pieces of glass. We don't know what happened to the missing portion of this. Uh, probably it was destroyed, as I said, in an earthquake or in the remodeling. There was a very major earthquake that devastated Antioch in the sixth century, uh, but there was remodeling going on ever since the house was built, and it was obviously occupied for generations. Um, we don't know if it was the same family over the generations or if it was changing hands in between. Um, these kinds of damages could also happen when, for instance, after the town was abandoned, um, there may have been earth subsidence, there may have been a gully that developed with um, excess rainwaters that came through and washed parts of it away. But in any case, as far as we know, this part of the mosaic was never found by the excavators. However, there does seem to be photographic evidence that there was another mosaic from the same room uh, the border matches exactly to this one. It has a different scene in it. 
And we think it probably went to the um, archeological museum in Antioch, uh, which in Turkish was called Antiaka. So uh, it may very well be um, that we have a sort of a, a twin, not a twin, but a sister uh, mosaic, if you will, to this particular one uh, in that other museum. These things that are, are little cubic sort of tiles, um, the Latin word for them is tesserae. And so it was a very specialized skill to be able to set them in place and make them um, fit very tightly together. And so it wasn't something that they could just pick kind of at random from a pile of different stones. They would sort of have to pick the size that they wanted, and often they had to be trimmed or cut to fit into the place they wanted to be in. Uh, we actually have some writings uh, from a, a Latin architect uh, who, to who told uh, posterity how um, mosaics were laid in houses um, and the way they carefully prepared a bed to put the mosaics down and then they put different layers and then finally they put a sort of a, a cement layer and when it was wet they could inset the stones and then they would harden and it would hold it in place uh, very well. And the cement was very, very strong and bonded really well. And it's kind of interesting how the uh, excavators would in fact remove these and take them off to museums and so forth. They would actually coat the whole surface with a kind of a glue and then put down a layer of burlap or canvas. And when the glue adhered enough, then they would sort of come in from the edges with a sharp sort of spatula or chisel and they would separate the tile from its concrete bed, and then when it was all separated, they would turn it over carefully um, so that it rested on its burlap or canvas surface. Then they could haul it off, and then they would reverse the process to set it in its new setting. And you can see these gaps, or lacunae, are filled with a modern cement to, um, to uh, make them adhere and to fill in the gaps. Um, so this, um, as I said, was acquired in 1945, and at that time, the director of the museum, Reginald Poland, actually had aspirations for creating a classical or an ancient art collection in the museum. Uh, prior to that time, uh, since our founding in 1926, the museum basically focused on European old masters and American art and some Asian art. But he really wanted to branch out and become uh, much more of a, an encyclopedic museum. So he embarked on a, a modest buying program. He bought a Roman sarcophagus. He bought a statue of the Pharaoh Ramses, the Egyptian Pharaoh, which in fact is in the next room over here at the visible vaults, uh, and some other objects from ancient uh, Rome. But um, the uh, departure of Reginald Poland in 1950 and then simply a, a change of, I think, philosophy and direction for the museum meant that the the antiquities uh, uh, collection really was never developed any further. And in fact, the sarcophagus was sold and then this was sort of relegated to um, a back corner of the museum and then put in storage. Um, the last time it was out was in 2006 when it was brought out in conjunction with a traveling show that we had called Instabiano that we borrowed from Italy. Uh, it was a, a show that exhibited artifacts and also um, frescoes removed from the walls of some of the villas uh, in the area that was destroyed by Vesuvius in AD 79, uh, a little town called Stabiae, and um, that show was um, highly successful, and our curator at the time installed this and a few uh, pieces of Roman glass that we have in our collection as a kind of a satellite show to that larger traveling show. So it, it isn't seen by the public very often, and I'm very excited to see that in fact today it's here in the visible vaults and our public can, can take a look at it and I think learn a little bit about a very important component of ancient art um, because virtually every house of any size or scale um, would have these uh, pavements on the floors in most of the public rooms. Uh, I think we're very fortunate in that this is a very nice example of a polychrome um, uh, mosaic because many of the earlier mosaics of Roman homes and uh, as I said some of the less uh, formal areas of a house might for instance just have uh, monochrome mosaics of black and white or uh, very simple patterns in geometric forms and so forth. So um, I hope that everyone enjoys looking at the mosaic um, and it will be up for uh, uh, a number of years to come. Thank you.